really wanted to get in and help other um, other people who are owning businesses achieve this level of freedom in their own business to be able to like get out of the day to day being the bottleneck of every single thing and be able to kind of take a deep breath and expand back into the parts of the business that you love. Hey y'all and welcome to the Cash Flow podcast where we're going to talk about everything related to the money in your small business. I'm your host Pam and without further ado, we're going to jump right into our episode. Hi everybody and welcome to the Know Your Map season of the Cash Flow podcast. I am so excited to have with me somebody I've actually just met recently in person, but I've known for a little while about her through social media. I have with me today Jenny B who has sold already a profitable copywriting copywriting and funnel strategy business because she wanted to avoid having to manage a team. Anybody else got that disease? Raising my hand. <laughs> Ironically, she's ended up leading not just a team, but actually a whole company as a COO. So best laid plans. But with the help of the Visionary CEO Academy, who was her right hand in building out that company. Today, she's head of relationship and partnerships at that very academy. And alongside Jill and Brianne, she helps coach seven-figure business owners, or owners to manage their teams in an hour a week. Okay, now that got my attention. And I'm guessing it got yours too. So without further ado, welcome, Jenny. Thanks so much for doing the podcast. Cheers. Happy, Cheers. Happy, happy recording day, Pam. Good to see you again. Happy recording day to you too. I'm so glad you're here. Well, where is here for you, by the way? I live just outside of Chattanooga, Tennessee. I have lived quite literally all over the world and then kind of came came back to my roots. And lucky for me, Chattanooga is infinitely cooler than it was when I left in the late 90s. It's really up and coming. I've like a lot of people I know are talking about Tennessee, Chattanooga, all of that now. Yeah. I don't know what's going on down there, but I'm going to have to pay it a visit and see. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's more predictable than um Florida, let's say, for example. <laughs> well, there's that. <laughs> there's the weather, that's for sure. So yeah. wait, you said you lived all over the world, literally. Give us some continents so we can get a sense of uh, just how far around. Um, well, I mean, I've lived all over the U.S. and then uh, Niger, West Africa. Um, I did. Wow. I did some language documentation. So my in, I was in a Ph.D. program many, many moons ago for linguistics. And I was working to document um, a minority language there in Niger, West Africa called Zarma and working on children's storybooks and writing those with a traditional storyteller to help um, give little kids an option of of learning to read in their native language so they wouldn't just be, um, you know, thrown straight headlong into the French system into a formal language. Yeah. 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 So, but I this love is, that. How long were you there? I have so many past lives, a total of probably about two years when you add. Wow. Up. Yeah. That is cool. So many past lives. All right. That just makes me want to ask more questions, but <laughs> I'll go ahead and jump into the now. So somehow these past lives all wound you into a copywriter business that you owned. Tell they, me a little bit about that. They did. So I was always that, uh, I was always, I don't think I wanted to be a writer when I was a kid in terms of, you know, some people dream of just having a published book and I want to author stories and stuff, but I did conscript my little brother to like having a story club in the top of his closet. (laughs) I love it. Poor little brothers. Oh, God bless him. Today's a successful lawyer, so it did not hinder his progress. I think it probably helped. I think you should take credit actually. (laughs) It was all me. I'm <laughs> I'm the wind beneath his wings, honestly. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. I love that. So into copywriting, you came uh, from yeah. the story well, manipulation corner of the world. Yeah. Just storytelling has always fascinated me. Uh, and when I, I've always just geeked out over things like psychology and systems. And hmm. I found that this, they dovetail beautifully together in the space of copywriting and talking hmm. to people, which... Clearly, I'm not a shy human. I, I love talking to people. But yeah, I hated to draw you out of your shell for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's like real, real or back in, people. Real or back in. Um, but for me, copywriting was this incredible way to help 
help change people's lives through um, facilitating them getting the help that they need or the change that they need Got uh, it. in their lives, kind of help helping overcome some of those barriers where people might not be brave enough to take whatever that next step is, because I've yep. worked in lots of different types of industries. So um, it ended up being as much mindset as copywriting, I'm guessing. It did. So I had, uh, at one time I had uh, this very robust program and I had students coming through it and I ended up kind of falling sidelong into the coaching aspect of it as well, because especially with women, um, that I was working with, they're a big piece of talking about what you do, of selling your product or your, uh, the service that you, that you provide to people. Mm -hmm. Um, there's a lot of psychology and there's psychology, of course, around the earning, the earning of the money and the stories that women tell about money. I'm not, I'm not a money mindset person. Obviously you, you clearly do a lot. More I see a lot of it for life. sure. Yeah. But even with, um, being you know, seen. What, yeah, it's like, what are we allowed to claim <laughs> about ourselves in the world? Like yeah. what is, what is true of me? And do I have to be humble? Um, I recently read, this is only a little bit of a rabbit trail. I read a book called uh, On Our Best Behavior, and it's about the seven deadly sins huh. and how the seven deadly sins, which used to be eight. and Oh, they did? I did not know that. There's a whole history behind this. Who knew? But I don't um, mind the rabbit hole. You're welcome to tell me. Well, so just about how, how pride and why women... Uh -oh. Um, don't, don't want to make claims about ourselves because what, what is pride? You know, yeah, that's true. Yeah. That is true. So yeah, money, uh, the way we talk about what we do, the way we grow our businesses, um, is really wrapped up in our identity, our personal worth, our value, what we feel like we like going out to stake a claim in the world, whether that's even permissible. So yeah, I ended, up, I ended up building a, a small business around, copywriting, but kind of rolling over into the funnel strategy, um, kind of Got sales, it. marketing, psychology, how all of those things. I mean, all those crazy rabbit holes we go down, right. That yeah. need help and nobody knows how to do them when they first start out for sure. Yeah. It's interesting. You talk about pride and it's, it's funny because like, I've never had a problem being confident in what I do at, at all. However, pride does strike me as one of the sins. And so what I find that I did in my entire career in corporate, and I deflected it as that's just good team leadership, which is when we succeed, it's the team. And when we fail, it's me. And I think that's just team leadership. But I also think it's a little bit of the overhyped humility um, mm -hmm. and, and I don't know where, I still don't know where that balance is. Right. So it is a real struggle for people, even people who are very confident in what they do. I, I think, mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's just not black and white. No, it's not. And, um, but it, that really does get down to the root of identity and what is your team as you are leading the team, how much of a stake do they have in the, in the success mm -hmm. and are they willing to own? It's like, Almost as a as an owner, sometimes you might be feeling like you're protecting people in some weird subconscious. The hero way. complex. Yep. Yeah, yeah. You're protecting your team from feeling the effects of failure because you just want to be positive and you want to encourage. But as I tell my kids, like one of our mottos is we're a team, we rise and fall together. I and love so that. the deeper that you can bring your team down into your decision making and your processes. And I'm not talking about like on a day to day level, but like, you know, is, is your team part of choosing the big projects you're going to be working Got on? It, yeah. on the quarter? Are they part of like get bringing ideas um, that the whole company is going to adopt? Um, how, how closely are you allowing them to come to the flame, which is, it can burn you, but it's also an incredible source of, of energy, of converting energy and making things happen in the world. That's a really neat frame around that. In fact, let's let's go ahead because from copywriting, so you obviously your company grew, obviously you had a team, obviously you said, shit, I want to manage people and sold it. <laughs> but then what the heck happened? <laughs> well, so I went to, I was at this interesting time in my life. I had been divorced for about two or three years, but I had a bunch of little kids at home. I think my oldest was, 
11 maybe at that time, four kids. Okay. And so I was just, I was getting tired and I knew that besides me and a handful of contractors, you know, I had some coaches that were contractors for me. I had um, some people that were starting to do writing for me, but the next step was either going to be assemble this ragtag group of misfits as it were into a functioning team and develop some, something more formal, mm -hmm. actually building a company or that's behind door number one, Alex door number two, <laughs> I could, um, I could go and work for a client who had become very, very successful. And she was a, a client. I started out working with her on sales strategy and copywriting, but and it ended up, we grew her company to a point that she needed to have somebody running all the sales and marketing all the time. Got it. So I was going to be doing a lot of copywriting, but it was going to be a predictable paycheck, which is always feels like a bonus, especially. Absolutely. If, to lure for all of us. Yeah. For as long as I had been, it was just something where I felt like, Oh, I can just, I can just do my job. Yeah. It's got its appeal every now and then, doesn't it? <laughs> it, did. it did. But, but, um, interestingly enough, because of the growth trajectory that we already had that company on, it was not very long at all until we started needing to pull together um, a team that was going to function that. together as a single unit. Like we could you know, it's funny, right when we get to our most tired of pulling the ship is when that team gets formed and it changes everything. Well, All of a sudden that energy can come right back. Yeah, it, either in a good way or a bad way. And I think a lot of people get into like, oh, well, I'll just have a team. And where the team is like eight contractors where you're still oh. having to make all the decisions all of the time, yeah. right? So that's the quote team with my yeah. little, if you're just listening to this on audio, I've got my buddy. does on the podcast, but that's okay. That's That was double quote. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, my rabbit ears finger is going. That's right. Um, so either you're, you know, if, if you have a couple of bad experiences with VAs dropping balls or trying to chase down projects and feeling like you've got these dark holes and corners in your business where stuff is living and you don't even know what's going on all the time, mm -hmm. um, just not having all the information you need and having to make too many decisions, it can give you a really, really bad taste for mm -hmm. having a team at all. And I think that that's kind of why I had shied away from, from yeah. growing my business into a full blown company. But luckily for me, we had um, Jill and Brand from Visionary CEO Academy were waiting in the wings and they kind of took me swept on. in. They did. They did. They, they definitely, I mean, they don't have their own superhero complexes, but I don't mean, I don't mind like shining lights on their capes every once in a while. Yeah. Yep. Um, but yeah, just helping me who had really good intentions, who had, I was really skilled at the things that I did and was willing to learn, you know, to stay scrappy and to be like, okay, I think this is going to be a really good thing. I'm willing to learn and having faith that because they'd worked with so many other, um, you know, people with, with yep. reputations out there that they were going to do something big. So yeah. And you I, didn't know them ahead of time. Like this truly was a leap of faith for you. It was. When you first met them. Yeah, it, it yeah. was. Uh, they And they they had a reputation in certain entrepreneurial circles that yep. I've been going along. And so I'd kind of seen them from a distance, but I had never worked with them. You know, and what any year was that, that you, that you actually came on as a client to Visionary Academy? That would have been... 2019, mid-2019. So pre-pandemic we are at this point. Yes, pre-pandemic. Okay. Yeah, and so I had the incredible benefit of of kind of growing through the pandemic as I'm growing as a leader of the team. And we ended up needing to make some really, really big pivots with some projects that we put on the side, We're, uh, coming up with brand new things to be able to pivot during okay. the pandemic. But at that time, I still had Brianne and Jill that were kind of the the back help helping support the backbone of my leadership within the company. Got it. Got um, it. So that's a very secure and safe feeling place to be because you know I clearly I did not set out to be a leader. Yep. Um, but it's really it's good to know that you've got like a safety net. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And that second, that number two position is such a tricky one. I was in it in corporate for a long, long time and I loved it. In fact, I convinced myself that that's what I did best and would do for the rest of my life best 
because you get this wonderful um, decision making authority, team building, all the things. And yet there's a layer above you and often support systems in the term in terms of consultants and that kind of thing. So there's this little bit of safety net there that lets you grow. And I'm, I don't regret it for a minute. And I don't think it's a cop out at all because you can grow in that environment a little bit before you're out doing it, you know, without the safety net. So mm-hmm. that I kind of get. So then what happened? Cause now you are taking this whole structure message that you learned to the world, because one of the reasons that I like, I have got to talk to you is the learn how to manage your team in an hour statement, an hour a week. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I, st- I still, I know you, I trust everything you say. And like that little voice in the back of my head is like, no way. <laughs> so tell us how you got to work with Visionary Academy and, and what y'all are doing now. Thank you. Yeah. I, um, it's, the, the processes that Jill and Brianne have built and the, you know, kind of the structures and rhythms that they've built over the last I think, eight or nine years that they've been using with lots and lots of people. Those are the very ones that I uh, came to learn. Now, the with the company that I was with, we had a membership site. Uh, we had uh, individual like shop kind of e-commerce side of, of products that we were running. And I had always witnessed them working with, let's say, you know, consultants, um, working with financial advisors or legal, you know, people who had legal advising firms, Mm -hmm. um, lots, lots of different types of business that they were working with, but we were able to take a lot of these same frameworks and they're flexible enough that I could adapt it to e-commerce and to adapt it to running membership sites and courses and that kind of stuff. Oh, Okay. So, because it turns out it's more about how the people, it's, it's not dependent on the actual product that you're delivering per se. It's tied into that because as we know, everything is deeply connected when you get into the ecosystem. Right, of the right. Um, so I, I stayed with that company for four years and kind of helped grow it to a point where we had turned lots of the projects that we had been doing for growth, had turned them into repeatable processes Love it. that I felt like I could really hand it off with yep. grace. And then part of it's my, my tiny little attention span. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have this problem myself. Yeah, <laughs> but like I, I decided that I really wanted to get in and help other, um, other people who are owning businesses achieve this level of freedom in their own business Love to it. be able to like get out of the day to day being the <sighs> bottleneck of every single thing and be able to kind of take a deep breath and expand back into the parts of the business that you love. love so part of, part of what it did was realizing, or part of what it allowed me to do um, was be like a living case study, right? For how you can take all the management pieces, how many, how many like 15 minute segments here and there and 10 minutes of this and hey, can you take a look at this? Um, and then not to mention all the mental burden of just trying to chase down contractors about deliverables that you thought were going to be here four months ago and they're still not here. And like feeling oddly like you're bothering them if you're interrupting them or yeah. So it's like all of this stuff, it piles up as of like a mental tax that you are. You don't even realize it's there. It's like the gray fog of finances that I tell people about. If you've got money troubles, it's always there. It's always in your head. Mm -hmm. And you think you're the only one dealing with it. And it just becomes this thing that infiltrates everything you do, every sales call, every family dinner, every, everything until all of a sudden it's not there. Mm -hmm. And then you're wow. It's a little scary at first, right? Because a lot of us get our identity from that chaos. It, it, it is. And I, I mean, there's, if you want to go into it at all, there, there's like, there's like nervous system components to this, right? Gotcha. Uh, it feels to me the same as, um, for example, being diagnosed uh, with anxiety and depression several years ago and realizing that my, like my nervous system had been fine tuned to complete chaos. Huh. Um, in in my case, as a child, like the violence and chaos uh, were part of this picture, and a lot of uncertainty and a lot of filling different roles, 
And since my nervous system grew up in that, I didn't even know it was there until I took Lexapro. Huh. And like the moment that I started, this is in my late thirties, I started taking Lexapro. And within a couple of weeks, I like, I was like, my face feels funny. Like, why is, like, why does my face, I was smiling. And your jaw was relaxed probably for, for the first smiling. time in 30 years. All wow. Time. And like, oh, I'm actually not, I'm actually a very cheerful, positive human. Um, but I it can't was even imagine pre to pro you. I mean, you did, all I know is you're like, this is the person I've seen, but it just goes to show it's, we all have this stuff to wrestle with and, and, you know, same kind of thing. You don't know till it's not there, what it's been doing to, exactly. to where you are. So what do you find is the most challenging thing for an entrepreneur when they're making the decision to work with you on this really important work, number one. And then what's the most challenging thing once they've made the decision and they're in the door? Um, the biggest, I think, hurdle of the, the question out there is like, is this going to work for me? Yeah. Because you have been in that business. You love the business. You built it with a dream, a goal, some kind of thing in mind. And for most of the entrepreneurs that I'm sure are in your audience, Pam, like they didn't build it with this like one size fits all, no. like the bro marketing model <laughs> of unlimited growth and blah, blah, blah. That feels very cookie cutter. Yep. So our clients have built their own processes. A lot of them have developed their own intellectual property along with this. They mm -hmm. have, they've been seasoned in the trenches actually doing the work. And so they can feel very kind of precious about mm -hmm. their business. And like they're afraid, like that. afraid that, it, that uh, you know, in coming to work with someone who is a scaling strategist, that they're going, we're going to be like, you know, pulling out the grenade pen and lobbing it over. We're going to destroy everything. And no, no, no. What I find instead is that people think it's going to be like a, a 90 degree turn and we're going to yep. start going all in this direction. But it turns out that if you are looking at data, if you're looking at information that we've already got about the stuff you're already doing, a lot sure. of times you've already got incredible things going on. And what you can use is like a one or two degree adjustment or, hey, let's, let's set up a framework to take this part of your business and help other people run that part of your business. Love that. So you can trust them to make great decisions on your behalf. So I think the, the scary thing, Pam, that a lot of people are worried about is that it's going to be some wildly different thing. It's going to be like learning a completely new language. And actually it is a lot more um, nuanced. It sounds like it's, it sounds like in working with you guys in particular, mm -hmm. it's taking your language and turning it into a system and, but still leaving the language. It's what it sounds like to me a little bit, but it's just dispersed a little differently and off of your, as the owner's shoulders. And then I'm sure, because when I think about this and what we would do for our company, I'm like, I'm sure I need a re-education mm -hmm. and, or a re something. And I'm sure there are plenty of blind spots where I think I'm, you know, I'm a great leader. Of course I get my team's input, blah, blah, blah. But I'm sure just as many times I'm blocking it and, you know, carrying on a little bit. So, you know, that re-education can probably be a little scary too, because, you know, we're used to, well, if we're right, we're right. But if we're wrong, we're wrong. And we'll take the heat kind of thing. So we were actually, uh, two hours ago, Pam, we were in quarterly planning with our clients for fourth quarter. Um, big stuff, a lot, a lot of our clients are putting into place things that will lead them into the new year, mm -hmm. like hiring on new team members that are going to come in and, and you know, take over components. How do you transition the, the kinds of jobs? How do you transition the responsibility and the ownership of those outcomes mm -hmm. to those team members? So like we're deep in strategy. Um, but before we do that, we're always celebrating like what let's look back at the, the quarter that was, Love it. what was successful already. And a woman named Anna was saying that she um, gave, she was celebrating that she had given one of her, her team members 
um, some just extra leeway. And her team member came back and surprised her by, by creating her own project and doing it and coming back with the results. Love it. Of this. And this is somebody that normally, I think this particular team member in this example was somebody doing social media and marketing and that kind of thing. But the fact that this team member who she had constantly been like, I don't know if I can trust her with this. Am I going to have to follow up? Like, you know, feeling like she I love it. was carrying the mental load of being like a babysitter. Yep. And Anna backed off, had the framework and the structure to be able to support her without getting all up in her business. Yep. And was so pleasantly surprised when, guess what? That the, this team member just rose to the occasion and surprised her with something new. It was a project. I love it. A project that every Anna single started. person on the team wants to grow and learn and and know the next thing and do the next thing. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. There is a place for every team member to take to participate at that level or whatever level they're comfortable. If they want to be kind of in the stretch and playing in the unknown, they can. And if they want to be more comfortable for a while, they can do that too, which is what I love. So as you know, we're you know I'm toying around with with this for my own team. But if people are interested in following up with you, how do they do that? Um, thank you for asking. So we're actually running an event. This Ooh, is coming up. It is good timing. It's actually going to be the first week of um, October coming up here. And it's going to be called the KPI Kickstart. So this is for business owners anywhere from about 250000 in revenue to about $1.5 million, which is a big um, a big wide yeah. of people, but this framework that we use to like gather around the KPIs, the information to keep your finger on the pulse of the business really applies at, at all of these, these levels, basically, you know, up to 250,000, a lot of businesses are figuring out what am I going to sell? How am I going to sell it? Who do I need to help? Like help me sell kind of this stuff. So we're, this is not for beginners Got it. Um, because if, if frankly, it's just not that useful of a process for you. It at might that point. Be. Yeah. At that yeah. stage of the business. Right. Exactly. So, but what we're doing is over five days, literally 15 minutes a day. Um, we're going to have a sprint where you've got 15 minutes a day of, of the information of the tool of the framework that you need to be able to choose and use the right KPIs for your specific businesses. KPIs. Yeah, that's gold. As a finance person, let me just interrupt and break that down for you. <laughs> Folks, you have heard me talk about if you can't see the dials on the plane, you're in trouble. This is which dials you need to be looking at from what I'm hearing. And well, first of all, I'm going to be there for sure. But I really encourage anybody who's got any interest. There you go. We got the pom-pom on the video. You can't see it on there. Maybe you heard it shaking the mic. But uh, I'm going to be there for sure. And we're going to be dropping everything we need to. I think it's KPI Kickstarter. Yep. KPI Kickstarter. Kickstart. Kickstart. Com. Uh, cool. And this is, it's a five day sprint. It's, it's actually Love part that. of our effort for, to, to continue down the road of reconciliation with indigenous people whose land we are all benefiting, benefiting from living <laughs> and uh, working on. So in North America, for sure, we are. Absolutely. That's great. So all proceeds are going to that cause. They're going to benefit specifically for this quarter is uh, the Indian Residential School Survivors Society. Love um, that. So this is a it's a local to the founders, uh, Vancouver, B.C., um, organization that helps with all types of support. Um, and you can look that up at the Indian Residential School Survivors Society. So, yeah, as part of our um honoring the the fact that we are like i i live and work on unceded cherokee territory um and so as part of our ongoing reconciliation work uh this is something that we do every quarter it's not always this specific event but mm -hmm. yeah it's, it's a big part of our business values so we're able to get more information out be there with helpful frameworks um and for for the amount of value you get the the price is just stupid Yes. It's a no, win for yeah. us and it's a win for the cause, which I think is such a, such an amazing one. And, and most of the folks who listen to me all feel the same way about business being very much a social institution and, and our obligation to, to give back and desire. It's it. Yes, it's an obligation, but it's also a desire for a lot of the folks that we talk to. So uh, I love that. And like I said, I will be there 
Uh, anything else or ways that we can contact you that you want to leave us with? And we'll make sure we get them all caught in the notes. Sure. Absolutely. If you want to email me at Jenny, J E N I, just the four letters at visionary CEO academy.com, or feel free to DM me on any of the socials. I'm there guys. I'm not shy. I love hanging out and talking with people. So um, Come find me on social and you'll see Jenny as a friend too. So you can always connect that way as well. So I have to wrap every episode with our know your map uh, theme, because what I have recognized in my career is that knowing the map of how you got to every person you've met is an awesome gratitude exercise. And what I can tell you is my path to you started with my mother's broken femur. So there you go. What happened is, and I'll give you the quick and dirty, which I will always do at the end of each episode, while my mother was lying in the hospital happily on morphine in no pain whatsoever, and I was there at two in the morning, Mm -hmm. bored out of my mind, but worried, I listened to a podcast on that podcast was Angela Loria talking about how to write a book a whole new way. I listened to it. I sent Angela an email, expected some you know, run of the mill email response system response. But instead she wrote me back at two 30 in the morning with a very personal note. We ended up meeting. I worked for her. She wrote my book. She helped me write my book, all of those things. And through her, I met Brianne, who is the owner of CEO visionary Academy who introduced me to you. So thanks to my mom's broken femur. I call I'm really glad to call you a friend now. Well, thank you. Um, me meeting you is probably honestly a a factor of Lexapro because, uh, it, (laughs) there you go, being able to be the person who goes out to events and meets people and, uh, and does things and gets to stay curious in life, uh, made me the kind of person who just raised my hand and said, I want to get out there and meet the people. And Uh, I was able to get introduced to you. I am so glad my circle's better for it. And all of us are better for you having spent this time with us. So thank you so, so much. Thank you, Pam. I appreciate it. All right, folks, we will see you the next time. Take care, everybody. I hope that video was helpful. And I hope you subscribe to my channel for more information on finances in your business.